Hello world, today we're in San Francisco. My name is Tam and I'm a machine learning engineer. I got my master's degree in machine learning and I worked at Fang. And so I'll be taking you with me to an AI conference, specifically the Ray Summit 2024. Not to be confused with Ray Bands. The conference spanned a whole three days, but I'm gonna give you the best parts and bite-sized pieces so you can be caught up with all the latest and greatest going on in the industry. We'll hear what OpenAI's chief product officer has to say about their new O1 models. We'll hear what the legendary Mark Andresen has to say about war and how AI is changing the battlefield. We'll see what NVIDIA, Meta, and a unicorn startup are working on on a technical level. And of course, you'll get to see firsthand what it's like to go to an AI conference. If this is your first time to my channel, which is pretty likely because my AI and ML channel is relatively young, welcome. And if you've been here before, glad to see you back again. This is my first time doing a vlog style video, so I hope the camera shakiness doesn't bother you too much. Let's first start off with why we should care about Ray. Well, it's a distributed computing framework. Tons of companies are using Ray, including OpenAI to train their models, and we know how big their models are. So that's why it's been a little tradition for OpenAI leadership to come and speak. Two years ago, it was then CTO Greg Brockman, and this year, it was supposed to be CTO Mir Marathi, but due to the OpenAI drama that unfolded yet again, just one week before the conference, CPO Adam Weil was invited in place of Mir Marathi. Damn, I was so looking forward to hearing what she'd have to say. I'm actually not sure about that. But all is good, the show will go on in three, two, one. Okay, that's cool and all, but let's get to the good stuff. All right, the hosts of the party, who are they? Ray is a distributed computing framework that takes care of scaling your local Python machine learning code to multiple nodes and GPUs so you can focus on developing your core machine learning work. They handle all the stages from data preprocessing all the way to inference, hence we can refer to them as an AI compute engine. And what's even better, they're open source. AnyScale, on the other hand, is a company whose founders are also the creators of Ray, who are from UC Berkeley. Woo, go Bears! It's the all-in-one platform that includes Ray and optimizations for Ray. It manages your infrastructure and clusters. It simplifies deployments and integrations into other systems. It keeps your system secure and data encrypted and it allows you to monitor and govern your computing resources, basically taking the stress off of doing massive machine learning jobs even more. I think a lot of us get caught up in this part of the machine learning pipeline because it's the sexy stuff, but actually there's so much else involved to make it run smoothly, and that's what Ray and AnyScale aim to take care of. And they're quickly being adopted by the industry as well, partnering with the major cloud computing providers like AWS and Google Cloud. One of the companies using Ray for their AI workloads is Runway, which is a startup that's reached unicorn status. Runway does video generation, and you can see how they've progressed so much in just a few years to get super realistic results. And now they're even funding AI-generated films. Is the death of Hollywood upon us? Now let's hear from Mark Andresen, co-founder and general partner of Andresen Horowitz, one of the biggest venture capital firms with a track record like Airbnb, Coinbase, and Instagram. Though those are mainly tech companies, Mark is closely in tune with every industry. So Mark does not shy away from tough topics either, as we dive right into how AI and tech are shaping war. What is happening? What, what is happening? Well, it's, it's, like, it's like 20th century versus 21st century. It's like, it's like, a, it's like, a, it's like a cyberpunk movie. It's fairly amazing, which is, you know, the, the, the Red Army, you know, the, the Russian military basically is, you know, driving tanks down. Um, and the Ukrainians are responding with, you know, first person, you know, basically literally professional video game players piloting in VR, you know, piloting autonomous drones. There's always, for the Russians, there's always a guy in the tank. For the Ukrainians, you know, there's, there's no guy in the drone. So, so, so there, there's, an, there's an asymmetry to it. And so, oh, I mean, it, it, we get these amazing asymmetries. And so the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Houthis, for example, are firing these, I think they're Iranian drones, you know, they cost, you know, whatever, you know, some thousands of dollars. You know, and we'll, we'll literally, the U.S. military will use like a $20 million Tomahawk missile, right, to like take out a $1,000 drone, right? So, you know, you, you have these like momentary, it's like slippage in time, right? These things shouldn't exist in the same era. Um, and so if you talk to people in the U.S. military, they're like, okay, now we need to basically reinvent the whole thing. Like the, the, the way that we feel everything from aircraft to submarines, like all, all these things is, is, is just going to completely change the world. The future is going to look totally different. 
Mark is also not shy about who's to blame for the state of the world. You mentioned that technology has become far more political than the past years. Um, what led to that? Yeah. So look, I think basically, so I, so I would start by saying I think it's our fault. Um, so I, I blame us, and by us I mean myself and my firm and my companies, and they're all, I think it's all your fault. Uh, <laughs> your uh, uh, shares the blame. So. Um, it's a hard pill to swallow, but we all indeed do play a role in it, but especially the investors. But Mark, the rising politician that he is, I've been spending a lot more time in DC than I used to. Leaves us on an optimistic note. One of the great things about AI is it's rolling out in actually a very democratic way. The best AI systems are rolling out to consumers first. And so the, the number of just ordinary people in regular jobs, in regular professions, um, you know, who are able to use ChatGPT or any of these systems today and are able to, you know, ask questions and get guidance and figure out how to, like, deal with complex situations or <laughs> make surprise you here that sometimes politicians are not completely consistent. Um, and we can leave it at that. Let's take a little bathroom break, check out my conference pass. Ooh, look at it go. Now we hear from OpenAI's chief product officer, Adam Weil, where one of the things we talk about is their latest Model 01. Can you share uh, anything about the challenges of turning that model into a product? Naming? Uh, <laughs> who's played with O1, just out of curiosity? Wow, awesome. Oh, okay, almost everyone. So one of the interesting things with O1, there were a bunch of uh, interesting challenges. Uh, you think of the normal kind of model building paradigm that we've been in, where you go you know, from an open AI one, GPT-2, 3, 4, 5 in the future, etc. They just get you, your training. You're putting he goes on, but he ends up sounding just like their O1 research article, which contained no research details. Literally just surface level stuff and... Mathematics and science is off the charts. If you use e evals like um, benchmarks like GPQA, which are like hard graduate level science evals that you can't just look up an answer to on the internet, it's better than 90% of all grad students. Yes, we know that already. This part though. But it's still kind of system one thinking, right? You ask it a question, you get an answer. The difference with O1 is so it's actually able to push the frontiers of knowledge. It's not just about what it's learned. It can, it can reason and, and get to new places. And that's, it's fundamentally different. So it's not just about doing a bigger pre-training run. You're actually applying more inference at, you know, compete at, at question time. Um, and that's a fundamentally different way to scale a model. If you want to understand that further, I have a video breaking down how O1 was designed and trained. Check it out if you'd like. It'll definitely help you to stay in tune with conversations like these, not just for OpenAI, but for all the LLM companies, like Meadows Llama models, which you'll be seeing very shortly. All right, enough of the keynote speakers for now. Let's take a little food break, check out the vendors and network a little bit. It was great meeting and chatting with everyone that I met at the conference. Now we wander into the breakout sessions. There were a lot of companies that came to speak, but the ones I found most notable were Meta's talk on Llama and Nvidia's talk on video curation. Starting off with the Meta presentation, we have the pleasure of tuning in to Joseph Spizak, who is a product director at Meta and drives many of the open source initiatives like PyTorch and Llama. So Llama is open source, but how does it stack up against the rest of the LLM options? Well, we see here that Llama performs just as well, while being vastly cheaper per token. In fact, the industry's trend is that the costs half every four months. The models are simultaneously getting better fast and getting cheaper fast. So how is Llama being trained? With pre-training, instruction tuning, and reinforcement learning with human feedback. To help scale and streamline the efforts, Meta incorporates synthetic data to offset some of the human costs and delays. The other term for this is RLAIF, reinforcement learning with AI feedback. Not to repeat myself, but if these terms are new for you, then definitely check out my O1 video. It'll make a lot more sense after that. Lastly, we finish it with a demo of Llama running on a mobile phone using PyTorch compiling libraries. There's nothing, nothing special here. So I caused a sort of campfire. The trick here is like to, to check out like how fast this is generating. So one of the coolest things we, so we had ARM speak at the, the conference uh, last week, and you see like running almost 40, almost 42 tokens a second, just running on like a mainstream Android device, which is like wild. Wow. Feel how snappy that is. And um, ARM actually demoed, I think 250 tokens a second, like pre fill and then something like 60 tokens a second generation. So if you think about it, this, is, this is a 1B model that's really coherent that actually will do agentic stuff like on your phone 
You hit almost 45 tokens a second there. So all of this, by the way, is like open source. It's on GitHub. You can get it, you can build the phone. You can build it on your phone, whatever. It's, it's like free, it's, the model's there. All the code is there, the app is there. So literally go get it and, and play with it, fine tune it, and build your own local agent on your phone. So, and that is it. Thank you so much, and thank you. Love it, that was fantastic. If any of you have tried Llama, I'd be curious to hear your experience with it. Now we head on over to NVIDIA's presentation, which is about, in order to train a video generation model, you need video data to train it with. But it can't just be any video data that's been licensed or scraped from the web. It has to be filtered and labeled and curated into a high quality data set. But unlike images, videos have that extra dimension of temporal information. So it makes curating a video data set a lot more difficult. More memory is consumed and more steps are involved. This is a more detailed version of their architecture. Feel free to pause the video if you'd like. I'm not gonna go into detail for it in this video, but if you have any questions, feel free to put it into the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. I'll elaborate on semantic deduplication though, because the example for that was cute. So basically when the paparazzi follow Jensen Huang like a celebrity CEO, you're gonna get a lot of videos that capture similar content. You don't need all the similar variations though, so you detect the semantically identical ones and remove the excess variants. All right, just checking in to see if you're still with me or did I lose your attention like these guys on their phones here? Okay, I won't hold you for much longer. I'll finish it off with this up and coming company that you're gonna be glad you heard about because not only are they using NVIDIA GPUs for their AI work, but they're also funded by NVIDIA. This is Recursion Pharmaceutical. They do AI from the ground up rather than AI as an afterthought. With the plentiful cell images that are available, they can now train models to generate cell images. They have models for gene detection that are getting better year after year. They use computer vision to monitor mice to more accurately observe drug impacts and efficacy. This is biotech with AI. And whoop, that's a wrap. That's all for this conference. Thanks so much for joining me. I hope you got to learn something new or were inspired by something as well. Now it's time to go back above ground and take a walk after sitting all day. This is me putting aside all of my social anxiety to film in public. Oop, there goes a driverless car. All right, off with this conference pass. This was the Tech Trance, over and out.